We're jumping back into our one another series. There's all sorts of one another passages. Some of them are each other. In, my, my, uh, in the New Living Translation, a lot of these are translated each other. But, uh, but either way, we're going to look at through these. And, and today, we're going to look at a, a, an interesting one, at least for me. Uh, but, but as we start, I, I think we all know this person. This person, he, he has no perception of personal space. And even as you keep backing up, they keep moving closer <coughs> and closer. Or she constantly has to interject herself into the conversation. She always has been through what everyone else has been through, but to a much harder degree than anyone else has been through. He, he absolutely can't just listen to a discussion, but he has to make sure that you know that he knows something about the topic. She has a story about every single person that walks through the doors. He has a I am better than you attitude. See, she has an opinion on everything and will let you know it. He drives with great aggression and sees nothing wrong with it. She is too passive and quiet. He is too loud and obnoxious. She wears too much perfume. He wears too little deodorant. <laughs> Welcome to the church. We all have our own idiosyncrasies, our puke peculiarities. Uh, we, we all have our quirks, uh, but, but, but we have to recognize that we still need to be able to get along with one another. You know, I have my own pet peeves that thing people, people, things people do that really bug me, that really push my buttons, that, that aggravate me more than they really should. You know, they really aren't that big a deal. But for some reason, some things just, just really grate my nerves. Chewing with an open mouth grates my nerves. Blowing your nose in public, maybe that grates your nerves. Refusing to put down the toilet seat, it grates my wife's nerves. <laughs> on and on and on and on we could go. We all seem to have our belief about how people should behave. This is acceptable behavior, and that is not. This should be done, and that shouldn't be done. But the truth is, most of the time, the things we get mad about, the things that frustrate us with others, really aren't that big an issue. They're really not a huge issue. It's usually something small. It just personally aggravates us and bothers us. Even though their actions may not be that big of a deal, our response to those actions sometimes are a big deal. The, the way in which we respond can be a big deal. The way in which we respond to those things can destroy relationships. The way we respond can create tension and division within the church. The way we respond can even become life-threatening. There are some statistics out there about drivers. According to two, the, uh, a study in 2016 by the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety, they said nearly 80% of U.S. drivers express significant anger, aggression, or road rage behind the wheel at least once in the past year. The most alarming findings suggest that approximately 8 million U.S. drivers engage in extreme examples of road rage, including, including purposefully ramming another vehicle or getting out of the car to confront another driver. Many drivers report engaging in the following types of road rage. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list them off. I want you to decide if you are in this category or not. 51% say that they have purposefully tailgated someone. Anybody in that group? <laughs> I've seen you drive. <laughs> You've been right behind me. I'm like, are you reading the serial number off my bumper? 47 say they've yelled at another driver. I don't call it yelling. I call it instructing. <laughs> 
45 say they've honked to show annoyance or anger. 33 say they've made angry gestures. We are not going through those gestures. 24 say they've tried to block another vehicle from changing lanes. The study's researchers concluded this. Inconsiderate driving, bad traffic, and daily stresses of life can transform minor frustrations into dangerous road rage. Far too many drivers are losing themselves in the heat of the moment and lashing out in ways that could turn deadly. Now, I know the statistics don't apply to any of us. However, they do show us that we can allow something that probably was pretty minor to really become pretty major just by our response to it. And the same is true in the church. What what was minor, we can make major just on how we respond. That's what our, our one another this morning is talking about. That's what it deals with this morning. Dealing with one another, not just in a better way this morning, but in God's way, the way God wants us to deal in deal with one another so that we don't allow our response to one another to become a major ordeal, but just a minimal inconvenience, something we just deal with. So if you have your Bible, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 is where we get our one another today. This is what it says, one simple verse. (coughs) Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Now, there's actually a couple different one another's in there, but they kind of are pointing toward the one another we're going to talk about, and that is making allowance allowances for each other's fault. Now, you might be thinking, well, I didn't even know that was in Scripture. I didn't know that I was supposed to be overlooking all of your annoying habits. You frustrate me, and I didn't realize that I was supposed to just look past all that. And I would say to you, you are supposed to look past all that. That's exactly what it says. In fact, it's not the only place. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13 says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Again, make allowances for each other's faults. Forgive others offenses. Don't get so caught up in what someone does. It was probably just a mistake. They probably didn't mean what you understood. They probably weren't saying it the way you felt they were. See, God has called you and me to live differently. We're supposed to be putting up with one another. We're supposed to be making allowances, overlooking, responding differently than everyone else in this world. And that's where so often I fall short. If you bug me, I let it get to me. And instead, I should embrace you and say, brother, I love you, and I'm so glad you irritate me. (laughs) Now, you don't really have to say it like that. But in your mind, that should be what you'll be saying. The original language here has to do with enduring. Enduring that which was possibly difficult. In fact, It is putting up with. That's really what it is. Put up with. Now, some translations talk about it as forbearance with long suffering. And to be quite honest, that's probably a better way of looking at it. We need to bear with one another with long suffering. With long suffering. The problem is when we put up with one another, we put up with each other's idiosyncrasies, we put up with each other's quirks, it can be hard. It can be tough. It can be difficult. It it can take real effort. And we've got to be proficient at it. Because to be quite honest, when we aren't proficient at it, it destroys the church and it destroys our witness. I was thinking about this. Jesus was coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. He had three of his disciples with him. This was a mount. I mean, it was awesome. He talked with Moses and Elijah and The disciples are like, hey, let's just stay up here. We'll build some shelters. We'll hang up here on top of the mountain. God spoke. He's coming down off the mountain, off this 
unbelievable spiritual high, as it were. And, and the first thing he runs into is this uh, argument, this, this struggle that's going on between the disciples and the crowd. The disciples haven't been able to heal this boy. And, and, and so there's this discussion. Why can't they heal the boy? And back and forth there goes this discussion. And Jesus has to walk into it. And so Jesus steps into the situation and he provides for the boy. He heals the boy. He takes care of the issue. But in Mark chapter 9, verse 19, this is what it said. It says, Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Now, when he says, how long must I put up with you? It's the exact same word that we're being told to do for one another. The same word. And I don't know about you, but when you hear what Jesus is saying there, what, it sounds like to me he's a little bit frustrated. How, how long do I have to put up with this? Sometimes we get frustrated, but we got to put up with one another. If God in the flesh can have a hard time with putting up with people sometimes, then we might have a hard time too. But he calls us to do it. He calls us to make allowances. In fact, Jesus displays it, and he empowers us to do it. So what does it mean? What does it mean to make these allowances for one another? How do we do it? What is it going to require of me to make allowances for you? What is it going to require for you to put up with me? Well, here's the first thing you need to understand is that, and I've already said it, but it is hard work. It is hard work. Our text says patience. But like I said earlier, the translation is long-suffering. And to me, that kind of gives us a better understanding of what we're talking about here. If you're going to make allowances for each other, you're going to have to have patience. You're going to have to have long-suffering. Now, I don't know about you, but even the word kind of speaks to what we're talking about here. It's going to be long, arduous, and you're going to have to suffer to do it. You're going to put up with me. It's going to take a lot of effort, and you're going to have to suffer to do it. We all instinctively understand that that's what it's going to take. To have that person that pushes our buttons and to love them anyway, to have that person who every time they speak, it's like someone is ramming a cactus in your ear and to listen to them anyway. We know it's going to take it. To have that person who comes up to you and even their facial expressions get on your last nerve going to take effort. But God says, do it. Do it. Do it. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 11, it says, we also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. We need to be praying to God, God, give me patience. Give me endurance with this person. Let me be the example of the person that I'm supposed to be for them. I, I know, God, that what they do drives me crazy, but I also know what I do drove you crazy, and you put up with me. So help me put in the hard work to put up with them. I almost took this out because of what happened, but I'm going to mention it anyway. There are really two ways to uh, handle pressure. They're illustrated by the bath, bathysphere. Uh, a bathysphere is that miniature submarine that can explore the deep parts of the ocean, and we just heard about one for weeks uh, that went down to see the Titanic and didn't come back. But anyway, the difference, the, the bathysphere is like this. They, they make them with huge plates still, thin, inches and inches thick, and, and they put this little window in there that's this inches and inches thick as well, and, and, and they're heavy, and they're hard to maneuver, and, and they're cramped inside, but when they descend down to the bottom of the ocean, they can see all sorts of things you can't see any other way. They experience things you can't experience any other way. However, when they get down there, they're not the only ones down there. When their lights are turned on and they look out that little bitty window, what they see is fish. And these fish are under the exact same pressure that the people in the bathysphere are under. But they deal with it completely different. The fish, instead of building thick skins to, to keep the pressure out, 
They remain supple and, and free. They compensate for the outside pressure through equal and opposite pressure from the inside. They, they allow their insides to be the same strength as the pressure pushing from the outside, as it were. And you know what? Christians should be like that. We, we don't have to, and we shouldn't have hard and thick skin. What we should have is an appropriate amount of God's power within us that equals the pressure that is pushing from the outside. We, we should have God inside of us to the degree and, and beyond so that we can handle whatever is pushing against us from the outside. And it's hard work, but it's also God's work. We, we seem to always take the route, at, at least I, I seem to always take the route, of what can I handle personally first before I turn to God? But that's not the route we should ever take. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, And I'm certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it, finally fit, till it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. We're, we're reminded, Paul reminds us, hey, God started the work. He's going to continue the work, and he's going to finish the work in you and in me. That doesn't mean we don't work at it. But we also recognize that it's not just our effort. It's God within us. Where do you need to be putting up, uh, putting up with more? Where, where, where do you need to allow God to put more into you? Who, who do you need to be working in the midst of because they're the ones that grate your nerves the worst, but they're also the ones that need your support the most? It's hard work, but where are you going to start putting in the work of putting up with others. That's the first thing. It is hard work. The second thing is it has a high price. If you want to do what God's calling us to do, then it takes a high price. We have to put in the work, but we also have to pay the price because according to our text, the price is love. We, we should be motivated to do this because we love one another. I should put up with you. You should put up with me because we love one another. It's not just any kind of love that's mentioned here, by the way. It's agape love, which is God's love, a God that, a, a, a God that, that displays sacrifice. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. We're, we're told, listen, this is what love looks like. Love looks like giving yourself up for other people. Now, let's be honest. Putting up with each other can be hard. I'm sure it gets on our nerves. In different times, we would just as soon steer away from that certain person. I can't take them today. But God says, hey, if you love them, you got to be there with them. You, 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 you got to put up with them because they're your family. They're, they're, they're part of the body. I've heard sometimes, well, I, I, I love Jesus but I can't stay in the church. What? Let me ask you a question. You go up to any husband and you say, hey, I love your brother, but I hate your wife. How are they gonna, what, how are they gonna respond to that? They're gonna like, <laughs> we're not gonna have much relationship anymore because I love my wife. You can't love Jesus and hate his bride. That's what, there's a price to be paid. It's a price. We, we have to be willing to give up ourselves. We have to be willing to sacrifice ourselves for everyone else. We got to recognize, hey, it's going to cost me something to love everybody, but that's what Jesus has called me to do. Maybe that's, maybe that person that was really bothering Peter was on his mind when he came to Jesus. You know, that guy, that guy that just really pushed Peter's buttons, that, the guy that he just couldn't stand to listen to him. Maybe he was, maybe that guy was on Peter's mind when he comes to Jesus and he asked him about forgiving. In, in Matthew 18, he's asking him about forgiving. He says, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? And then he gives an answer. Seven times. Now, Peter's thinking to himself, that's a huge amount. Seven times. That's a lot of forgiveness. But not, Jesus said, no, that's not enough. No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven times. Or in other words, there's no limit to the amount of times you should forgive people. Is that you and me? 
You know, how many times, you know, I can't tell you how many times somebody says, you're not going to believe what so-and-so did to me. I'm like thinking to myself, first of all, don't tell me about it. Second of all, forgive them. How are I know it's hard to forgive sometimes, but just let it go. Give it to God and forget the person. Come on. Yes, I've said things that bother you. You've said things that bother me. I love you. You love me. We're still good to go. Let's keep trucking. Let's keep going. A man received notice that his son, during his senior year of high school, had failed a course. And the father had determined that his son was going to go to one of the best colleges. So he realized that this failing grade was going to jeopardize that possibility. And so he immediately went in and he started berating the son's teacher for this failing grade. Stormed into the classroom. He proceeded to accuse the teacher of being unfair. He threatened to have the teacher's job if the grade wasn't corrected. The teacher, who believed the grade was <coughs> deserved, not only would not change the grade, but he held his ground and he said, I I'm just not going to be able to do it. Well, the father left the classroom in enraged. He's like, this is not what I came here for. And so he heads to the principal's office. <clears throat> when he gets there, he's in a torrent. I mean, he is demanding that something happen, that the principal intervene. The principal, who knew the situation and who believed the teacher had been in the right, stood by the faculty member and would not intervene on this grade. The father's rage escalated, and he began to spew threats against the principal. I'm going to go to the next school board meeting, and I'm going to have your job. And at the height of the tension, there was this brief pause. I guess the father was catching his breath, and all of a sudden, the principal spoke up. This is what he said. Sir, I can see that your love for your son is very strong. Sir, I can see that your love for your son is very strong. In an instant, the anger and the rage began to dissolve away, and the father began to cry. A sense of healing began to take place, all because this principle, full of God's grace, had become a channel of that grace to this angry father. And that's my question for you. And for me, we, we, we have been filled with the grace of God. Can we not just share, pass on, be a conduit of that grace to those around us as well? Because just like this principle, when you show grace, all of a sudden it can change even an abusive uh, interaction into one of healing and forgiveness and restoration. I know this principle being reamed out by this father is more than just some kind of pet peeve situation, but the same grace that the principle showed should be the same grace that you and I show. In James 1, verse 19, it says this, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. James Intentionally or unintentionally, I don't know, but has essentially laid out a way into, for you and me to deal with those pet peeves that seem to always be bristling us up around other people. And that is to actively listen, to try to understand the why, to choose our response carefully, and to not allow our emotions to sweep us away. Are you and I willing to put up with people who great our very last nerve, as we should? Are we, are we willing to pay the price so that God will be glorified and so that family can be restored and so that the world can see a difference in you and in me? I'm always reminded of how much God has put up with me. How much can I put up with others? Dale Moody had this great quote D.L. Moody said this, right now I'm having so much trouble with D.L. Moody that I don't have time to find fault with the other fellow. Right now I'm having so much trouble with Todd 
and I don't have time, energy. I don't have anything left to try to find fault in you. What a difference it would make if we would bear with one another like God has called us to. We would make allowances for one another's peculiarities. We, we would love each other even though each other has these quirks that just drive us mad. What a difference it would make if you and I could look past our pet peeves. What a difference it would make if we would commit ourselves to the hard work of being patient with one another and the costly work of giving ourselves to one another. What a difference it would make if we could place not ourselves, but other people above ourselves. Not what I want, but, but the family of God above my needs. Where do you and I need to show this compassion <coughs> rather than criticism? Where do you and, I, you and I need to put others first rather than ourselves first? Where do you and I need to love more and forgive more? Because God has called us to bear with one another, to make allowances for one another. Who do you need to make an allowance for in your life? Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for all you bless us with. We come this morning, and I am challenged by this text because it really hits me where I live. I lots of times get so frustrated. And, and there are some people that really can push my buttons. But Lord, I, I need to recognize that you've called me to be that person that makes an allowance for others, that, that can look past those quirks and and those qualities that I just don't particularly like and embrace that brother or sister anyway, to love on them, to care for them, to let them know that they are important to me. Lord, I pray that we as a body of believers can be that, can show that, can, can, can be an example in our world of what it looks like to say, yeah, we're different. We don't always look the same. We don't always act the same. We don't always... Think the same way, but we love Jesus, and because of that, we love each other. Lord, thank you for loving me, even though I've got so many faults. And I pray that I can love others the same way. Let me put in the hard work. Let me make the effort. Let me give of myself so that others can see you through me. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.